Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. If you listened to episodes 263 and 264, you'll remember tonight's guest, Kyle. On those episodes, he told us about the two dogman encounters he had in the Daniel Boone National Forest with his dog, Jake. For the listeners who missed those shows, Kyle, please tell them about yourself. I'm a coon hunter from eastern Kentucky, and I uh, took you on a journey with me, my dog, Jake, my grandfather, and uh, everything that I went through. Yeah, it was quite the journey, unfortunately. Not a good one. Since you did those two shows, how have you been dealing with those experiences? Well, I was in good headspace for a while, and I feel like from doing my first two episodes that it helped me a lot. You know, I was able to move past a lot of things. You know, I was able to go forward in my life without thinking a lot of it. And I'd said before that I would never be a field researcher for the dog man to learn anymore. But somehow my past has came back around. And in some ways, I feel like my papa had left breadcrumbs for me to find out more truths about the dog man. And uh, what it is and where I came from, I guess, my history. And it's all came around full circle for me. And that's how me and Vic came to talk again about some things that I found out over time. Yeah, the things you found out, they're not easy to deal with, to say the least. Speaking of that, four days ago, a boy was killed under strange circumstances in Kentucky. That incident caused you to start doing something you hope not to do again. Please expand on that for us. Well, four days ago in the state of Kentucky, a young boy was killed, 13 years old, at his home. And um, he was killed by a canine, which is at this moment is unidentified. Some folks are saying that it was a coyote. And from what I've read online in the news articles, the boy was dragged away from his home six to 400 yards up a cliff face where he was killed by this canine. And after learning that news, it brought a lot back because it's just not possible for a coyote to drag a 13 year old boy up a cliff face. And it's really messed me up because it's brought back a lot of things. Yeah, you know what they say, it's best not to open up old wounds, for good reason, too. You told me you didn't think you'd ever come back on the show. What made you decide to come on and do that? Well, as I said, that I had no interest in doing any field research on the dog man. I'd like to stay as far away from it as I can, really. But uh, as I got more comfortable with the truth and with telling people, I was able to reach out to one of my cousins and I let him listen to my episode 263 and 264 on the dogman encounters. And right after that, he told me that I really needed to talk to my uncle, that he had a lot of information that I would probably like to hear about the dogman. So of course, when I heard that, that, that kind of blew my mind, but that's what led me into calling Vic and talking to Vic today. Well, I'm glad you did contact me, so I can hopefully help that way. Like you just told us about, you recently found out about dogman encounters your papa and uncle had years ago. Please tell us what you know about their encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well, before I tell you these encounters, I'd like to let everyone know that these are not encounters that I had. These are encounters that my uncle had, which is my papa's brother. and. With that being said, I can only give you the details that he gave me. Like he didn't go in that much description on what the dog man looked like because he said it looked similar to the dog man that I seen. 
The only difference is the name Dogman. He did not call it the Dogman. And we'll get into that further through the episode. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My uncle told me that when him and my grandfather were young boys, that my grandfather worked for a man they called the dog catcher. And uh, the dog catcher, that was what he was. He was a dog catcher. He would get paid to pick up stray dogs and place them in homes or whatever they'd done with them back in the old days. I'm not sure exactly what he'd done with them. But my papa started working for him first. He'd catch these stray dogs, take them to the dog catcher, and the dog catcher would give him a little bit of money. Wouldn't be a whole lot, but, you know, it's probably a lot for him back then. And then he got my uncle involved. And my papa actually told me bits and pieces of this encounter. But he didn't tell me that it was an actual encounter. It was my uncle who told me it was an encounter. One day, they got a dog, captured a, a stray dog, and they took it to the dog catcher's house. This particular day, the dog catcher wasn't there. They didn't know where he was. So they thought, well, he might be back at the back barn on the back end of the property. So they walked back there to the back end of the property. Once they got to the back end of the property, there's a barn. And on that barn, the barn was completely wrapped around multiple times and razor wire barbed wire. And it also had railroad ties that were staked down to the ground and against the barn itself. At that point, they didn't know if it was to keep people from getting in, but it was later that they'd find out it was to keep whatever was on the inside from getting out. And so they didn't see any sign of the dog catcher there. So they decided they were going to walk around the barn. So my papa and my uncle both start walking around the barn. And once they started walking around the barn, they realized that there was something on the inside that was following their every step, every step that they took, and was growling like a, almost like a deep rumble is what he said. And they could smell like a, a really putrid odor, you know, a stink. And they walked around the front of the barn, the barn entrance. That was also barbed wired up and railroad tied. The only place on the whole barn that was not barbed wire and railroad tied was a ladder that led up to the loft of the barn. So as they walked around the barn, they noticed the dog catcher's nowhere to be found. He's not here. So they kept hearing this rumble on the inside, you know, this growl or this rumble, whatever animal it was on the inside of the barn. They thought at first, you know, maybe that's where he takes his dogs that he catches. They didn't know at this time. So, Around that time, my uncle looked through a crack in the barn, and when he looked through the crack in the barn, it was too dark to see anything. So then my grandfather took another couple steps forward, and whenever he'd done that, he realized that there was light in the barn and that he could see inside of the barn, but whatever that was that was following them as they walked around the barn was blocking the light. And each time, whatever it was that was inside the barn, pressed up against the walls of the barn, the barn actually shook a little bit. So it had a lot of weight to it. At this point, he wouldn't, it still didn't bother him that much because he thought, well, it might be a big dog. But then again, the whole barn shook. So as he looked through the crack in the barn and could actually see a little bit, that's when he noticed it was a dog man. But again, he did not call it the dog man. We'll get to that point later on. And it was standing on two legs, on its back legs, and it had drool protruding down its face, just saliva. And he said when he seen it, he instantly took off running, and my papa did too. They ran off together. And my uncle told my papa that they were never going to go back to that house again. A short while after that, the dog catcher disappeared. You know, he wasn't nowhere to be found, and the barn itself had been bulldozed over. It had been torn down, torn apart, bulldozed, you know. They're not sure what happened to the dog catcher, where he went, if he if he moved, if he just up and packed 
and just left or if something happened to him they didn't know they were just kids and my uncle told me that looking back on it he thought that maybe the dog catcher was taking these dogs that they caught and taking them up to the upper loft and pitching these live dogs to this dog man then he also said that maybe he had recently captured this dog man somehow and that that's why it was in the barn and then he also speculated that maybe he'd caught it when it was young and raised it somehow but he wasn't sure exactly how it got in the barn but that's what he's seen inside the barn and that was the first encounter that he had during my uncle's second encounter this happened years later by this time he was a young adult and he had his own farm his own property cows and chickens and ducks and he had tobacco just about everything everything that the farmer has he had and still has to this day this particular encounter happened he had a tobacco field and the tobacco was ready to be harvested to be cut and he had some workers that were supposed to show up at his house and while he's waiting for them to show up he gathered his lunch pail put some bologna sandwiches in it and bread and stuff like that and walked down to the tobacco field by himself and then once he got to the tobacco field he had some tobacco knives that needed to be sharpened up so he walked about a roll into the tobacco field is what he said and he sat down and began to sharpen his tobacco knives and his tools get everything ready for the workers that were showing up to help and then as he was getting everything ready and sitting there he heard something moving in the tobacco the tobacco was above his head is what he said at this time so he couldn't really see what it was that was moving in the tobacco field but he knew by the way it was moving that it wasn't an animal and he thought first thing that he thought in his mind was that it was a trespasser so he stood up and started following the sounds that he heard on the dried mud you know the dirt something moving through the tobacco field once he started following the steps it would stop and then he would stop and then once he started walking again it would start walking again the person that he thought and he had a really odd feeling like something wasn't right so he turns around to go back to his tobacco knives and stuff walks back towards the role that he was in once he walked back to the role it was in just a little bit behind him something started moving again instead of sitting down by his tobacco knife he turns back around towards the sound and runs towards it thinking it was still maybe a trespasser he ran all the way out the other end of the field once he gets to the other end of the field out into the open grass field that was at the end of his tobacco field that's when he sees a dog man running across the wide open field into the woods at this time he goes back to the tobacco field turns around goes back leaves all of his stuff walks back up to the house shuts and locks the doors the workers show up to help work on the tobacco field and he refuses to go down to the tobacco field again he's done with it he says no i'm done with it i'm not going back down there you all can go down there and work if you feel comfortable and i'll pay you for it they went down there and worked they done the day's job nothing happened they never seen anything never heard anything went home that was it that was the end of that encounter and then it was just maybe months after that he said that he had a, a third encounter on this third encounter he kind of started forgetting about the dog man what he'd seen everything going back to his routine life everything was fine he got up early one morning and went down to the chicken coop to feed his chickens for the morning as he's down there feeding the chicken coop he keeps hearing the cows bawling down to the lower field he kept hearing them bawling and he thinks it's odd but sometimes you know how cows go on and one cow that he hears in particular bawling is his bull his bull's bawling loudly over and over and over again a little while later after that as he's sitting there listening after he feeds his chickens he starts seeing his bull start running up the fence line towards the house and once he sees that bull running up he, 
he's noticing that it's tripping and, and kind of stumbling over and over again consecutively over and over and over again the bulls just having a hard time standing up a little bit later after it gets a little closer to him he sees a big black lump sitting about four or five feet off its hind end and that's when he noticed that it was a dog man and it had its mouth lashed onto its back its hindquarters like it had its mouth its jaws wrapped around the hindquarters but it was holding on to the the hind end of the bull kind of sitting on his back a little bit and as it would take a step he'd seen that the dog man had its hands down by the hind legs of the bull and as it would run that dog man would grab a hold of those legs and jerk them back real hard really hard like a a real swift jerk motion trying to trying to make the bull fall down it's like trying to make the bull slip almost and fall down and then after a while the bull had all it could handle it had enough it did all it could do and it finally just ran through the fence it ran through the barbed wire fence and as it ran through the barbed wire fence the dog man that was on the back hind quarters of the bull got entangled in the fence it wasn't very far from him at all and as it was tangled in the fence it kept trying to push the barbed wire off itself with its hands it reached down with its hands and try to push the barbed wire off and it would do kind of a quarter turn sometimes and try to drag itself with its front arms out of the barbed wire and the whole time it kept blood crazing over and over and over again and that's what made my uncle leave as he seen it and it was scaring him but the whole time it was blood crazing over and over and over again it kept making the same exact motions and anyone who's been around animals know if you see even a domestic animal that's blood crazing that you stay away from it and for the folks that don't know what a blood crazing is it's whenever a predator most of the time it attacks a prey and it gets blood in its nose and its nostrils and it keeps blowing that blood out because the prey that it was attacking got away it keeps blowing the blood out of its nose onto its face and licking its mouth over and over and over again crazy blood crazing in that moment it's crazy it's gone crazy over the animal or prey that it was attacking during that time and so he ran up to his house to grab his gun and had every intention of killing this animal but before he done that one detail i left off was that he noticed that it only had one eye the other eye had been put out knocked out or scratched out he wasn't sure he only had one eye that had happened before the encounter with the bull but he ran up to his house and grabbed his gun out whenever he grabbed his gun out of the house the bull had ran all the way up to the house itself and was actually trying to get on the porch because it was so scared to get away from the dog man and he had a hard time trying to maneuver the bull to get the bull out of his way so that he can get back down to the dog man once he finally did get back to the dog man it wasn't there it was gone nothing was there besides fur and a little bit of blood it left behind some fur and some blood and that was it that and the broken fence that the bull had ran through and that's the end of the third encounter on my uncle's fourth encounter i have to warn you all it's gruesome my uncle had a hobby of raising rescue fawns what i mean by rescue fawns is baby deers whose mother had been killed most of the time due to you know a car accident a car hit them so he would pick up rescue fawns and people would also bring him rescue fawns fawns that were too little and didn't have a mother and he would raise them up on his farm he didn't deer hunt or anything like that but he, he loved nature you know he loved taking care of animals he never was a hunter him and my papa were total opposites on that because my, my papa was a hunter and he was not so at this time in his life he had two fawns and one yearling you know a fawn is still on the bottle and starting to feed on grass 
and his yearling is just about full grown and they'll stay at your house when you raise them up if they're a doe until they come in their first heat once they come in their first heat they'll leave but if you raise them domestic they'll still come back around even after they've had fawns of their own so as i said he had two fawns and a yearling and uh, that day his neighbor came over and they were playing a game of mumbly peg out in his yard mumbly peg is a old country game of throwing knives pretty much and as they were playing mumbly peg he noticed this black spot in the corner of his eye this is how he explained it to me he, he seen a black spot in the corner of his eye but he didn't pay it no mind because he thought it was almost like a fly was moving in the corner of his eye you know kind of swatting it away because it was moving so fast so he thought it was a it was a fly so unbeknownst to him what it really was it was a dog man on a ridge just to his right that surrounded the house it went around like a big bowl almost the ridge did ridge line and as he was playing mumbly peg his neighbor that was there yelled at him here comes Slewfoot. And at that time, my uncle turned around, and that's when he seen the dog man. And it was running full speed, and that little tiny black dot that he seen that was on the ridge line moved so fast. He thought, like I said, it was so small at that time. He, the very first time he seen it, he thought it was a fly because it was moving so fast. And it ran right through his yard, and the yearling doe that he had was eaten in the yard. And he crushed her. The dog man jumped right on its back and crushed her like a pop can is what he said. That's how he explained it to me. That he'd never seen anything kill so efficiently. Just one hit crushed her like a pop can. Had broke all four of her legs and her back at the same time. And was packing her through his yard. And as he was packing her through his yard, it took to the hillside. And once it had this yearling deer in its possession it wasn't moving as fast as it was before you know it couldn't quite carry her as fast as it was when it was moving for the stock for the kill so him and his neighbor ran inside his house and he got a mosin magot mosin magot shoots a 76254r round it's a military grade weapon for world war ii shoots a full metal jacket and he'd raised this yearling up from a fawn from a baby on bottle she meant a lot to him he loved this rescue deer that he had so he took to the hillside after it and then he chambered around got a good line of sight right at the back of its head he pulls the trigger when he pulls the trigger he hits it in the side of the neck the bullet drops as it's going uphill. He hits it in the side of the neck and it sprays blood everywhere. He must have hit an artery or something, he says. And when he hits it in the neck and it sprays that blood everywhere, that's when he realized that this thing was not a demon, that it was real. And it was an animal just like anything else. And when he hits it in the neck and it sprays that blood everywhere, it drops the deer. Of course, they walk up to the deer and it's gone. It's been crushed like a pop can that's how he explained it to me that it was crushed like a pop can all four legs were broken its back was broke it was just a meat sack pretty much at this time and then he continues following the blood trail to try to get another shot on the dog man he never told me if it was standing on two legs if it was on four legs or what he continued to pursue it to chase it and it was getting out of sight but he he felt like he had a good shot on it that was a kill shot and he tracked it and he tracked it even after it was out of sight until it was gone he couldn't find it him and his neighbor they looked and looked and looked and they never could find it they don't know if it ran off and died or if it wasn't a good enough shot that he thought it was or what exactly happened to it so they went back down to the yearling that he'd raised up and they grabbed her and packed her back to the house and once he got back to the house in his yard the other two fawns that were there had been completely slaughtered and he said 
he told me it looked like that someone had stuck a grenade in them. That they were all over his yard everywhere. All the entrails, everything was everywhere, all over his house. And none of the meat was taken. The only thing that was missing on both of the other two fawns that were left at the house that were completely fine when they left to pursue the dog man was the head. Both heads were gone. The rest of the body was obliterated all over the yard. And that was the last encounter he ever had with the dog man. But one thing I forgot to mention was as that dog man was taking the first yearling out of his yard, it did look back at him and he seen that it only had one eye. And it was the same exact dog man that attacked his bull months before that. Wow, that's awfully creepy. That same one was still around. You mentioned the name Slewfoot a few minutes ago. There's something about the name Slewfoot that shakes you up. What's the story behind that? Well, the story behind Slewfoot, and as I said earlier, that the first time I talked to my uncle, he had asked me why we called this creature the Dog Man. And I went on to tell him because that's the name. That's what it goes by. That's what everyone knows it by. And he had told me then that I knew the name. I've always known the name. And once he'd said the name was Slewfoot, that's whenever I remembered. And it completely shook everything that I thought that I knew to the core. Everything. My entire childhood moments came back to me of stuff that my papa had told me. And what Slewfoot was or is, Slewfoot is a folk legend from an old bluegrass song called Slewfoot. And that's what I'd always known it as growing up because every child that was raised here in Kentucky has listened to bluegrass music. And the legend of the song is Slewfoot is a bear that had never been shot and never been treed that was virtually unkillable. And so what my uncle began to tell me after that really rocked my world. He had told me years and years before that that song was about the dog man. That's what the dog man was called, Slewfoot. And that the words in the song, Slewfoot, had to be changed to a bear, although at that time in Kentucky, with the hunting regulations, Kentucky had no black bear. They were virtually extinct from the state of Kentucky. There were none at that time. We didn't have any hunting regulations. So years ago, people just killed them, and there was none here. And so what my uncle told me was the time that that song came out, it was about the dog man because there were no bear in Kentucky at all. And you can actually get on Google and look, and you'll find out that during the 40s and 50s, there were virtually no bears in the state of Kentucky. 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, there were none here. They're just now to the point in Kentucky where there's only a couple counties that you're allowed to even hunt black bear in because there's still not that many. So the words in the song had been changed over the years, and there's the lyrics in the song that goes, Bear Tracks, Bear Tracks, and it used to be Wolf Tracks, Wolf Tracks if you've ever listened to the song or you go back and hear it. And the reason why it was changed to a bear, because bluegrass music is a form of gospel, you know, church music. Most bluegrass songs are. With that being said, the church back in the day did not think that the dog man was a creature. They thought it was a demon. So they thought it was inappropriate to sing a song that's a tribute to a demon instead of an animal or something with the Holy Spirit. So how it really messed me up was there's times in my life as a kid, I look back on the things that my papa told me. Like there's one instance I was playing in the creek by myself and my papa told me to stay where he could see me. And so I said, why? Why do I need to stay where you can see me? I'm okay. 
and he said that he didn't want Slewfoot to get me. And this is years before I was just a kid. I hadn't had no encounter at this time of my own. And so a little bit later after that, me and my sister and a few of my cousins, we decided we were going to go stay all night with our grandparents, my papa and my mama. So one particular night, I remember we were all asleep in pallets on the ground or sleeping bags, you know, been watching TV and everything. We'd all stayed over there. And my papa had picked me up off the ground, off the floor, and my pallet I was sleeping in my sleeping bag and put me on the couch. So that next morning, I remember asking him vividly, Papa, why'd you put me on the couch? And he said, you were sleeping under the window. I don't want Slewfoot to reach in and grab you. So that shook me hearing this stuff, hearing the old folks refer to the dog man as Slewfoot. And that that was his first name. The dog man's first name was Slewfoot. And then I also remember my papa telling me that there was a time when he was growing up that there was a gathering, a large gathering of people, and that something bad had happened when he was growing up, and that people were trying to track Slewfoot, and they tracked him over several counties, all the way down into some say Tennessee. You know that's the legend. But my grandfather said that that happened, that there were a large group of people who had hounds that tried to track Slewfoot. Slewfoot being the dog man, not a bear, not a bear at all. So then there's another thing that happened, particularly with my grandmother. I was listening to the radio, just a small child, and uh, the song Slewfoot came on the radio. I was listening to it on a bluegrass station. I started singing it. You know, it's a good song. Started singing that stuff. And I remember my grandmother coming over and turning the radio off. And then she grabs hold of me and looks at me right in the face. She said, listen, you never, ever listen to that song. That song is not about a bear. It is an evil song about a demon. So I said, no, it's not. It's, a, it's about a bear. She said, it is about pure evil. It's about a demon. That's what she told me. And I didn't understand it. You know, I was just a kid. I'm like, this song's about a bear. Or so I thought. And then there was another incident that happened. All these incidents about the slew foot happened before I ever had my first encounter. And as I said, I feel like it was my grandfather leaving me breadcrumbs that I would one day discover the truth. What all this really is from his own brother. So there was one time that I'd woke up early and we'd had a big snow. And Kentucky's not known for a whole lot of big snows. Every once in a while, it seems like every couple of years, we'll have a really big snow. We've had big ones in the past, but I remember this particular morning, there was a good snow on outside, you know, eight or nine inches. And I'd walk through the living room. My mama was in the kitchen. And usually at this point, she's out on the farm taking care of the chickens and ducks and whatever else was out there she had to feed and water and, you know, take care of. At this time, she was inside the house. And she told me to stay inside the house that I was not to go outside. And as a child, I was thinking, she just doesn't want me to go out and play in the snow. We never have snow. I want to go out and play in the snow. So I put on some clothes and stuff, and I went out the back door so she couldn't see me. And as I went out the back door, I remember seeing my grandfather, my papa, over on the side of a hill, and he had a rifle in his hand. And... I walked over to him. He told me I need to get in the house. I said, what's going on? Like, why can't I be out here? And then I, once I got over there beside him, I wasn't allowed to leave because he didn't want me to go back into the house because I was right next to him. I guess he didn't at that time feel comfortable with me walking back to the house as a child by myself at that time. And I noticed he was walking down the mountain towards the bottom of the property, towards the driveway. There was these tracks in the snow, these big tracks. At that point, I didn't know what they were. And I said, Papa, what are you doing? He said, I'm tracking Slewfoot. He came right through our property, through our driveway. And he tracked from the top of the mountain all the way down the mountain through the driveway and into the woods. At that point, I thought, 
okay, he's talking about a bear because that's what I thought Slewfoot was. But it wasn't a bear. It was a dog man. My papa was tracking a dog man as I was a child across his own property in the snow. That's why my grandmother stayed in the house and would not go out and work on the farm. So with all this new news, it's brought up so many different things, like trying to discover what else do I not know? You know, what else have I, have I missed that I should have picked up on? And my uncle told me any old timer that's around his age in their 90s that lives in the state of Kentucky will tell you that Slewfoot was not a bear, was not a bear at all. Well, not to jump to conclusions, but it only makes sense that if you didn't have black bears around in Kentucky back then, that they must have been talking about something else. So that all makes good sense. Yeah, I mean, with the modern technology we have, we can get on the Internet on Google and you can look it up that we didn't have black bear in Kentucky during that time. They wasn't here. So with that being said, what was it? It had to be what my uncle said it was. Now, I agree. You're making some really good points. Did your uncle ever say if the bull the dogman attacked died from its wounds or if it recovered? He never was specific about what happened. That's something that maybe I should have asked him. But I assume that it lived because it was right up there on his porch, you know. The bull was trying to get as close to my uncle as it could because it felt safe. And that's the reason why the bull was running towards my uncle it was because he felt like that my uncle could do something about it. It was running towards the house, like from the bottom field all the way up to the house. And it was a, quite a distance that it ran. It ran every bit of three or 400 yards from the field up to the house. And it's all straight uphill. Because my uncle lived on the hillside that was surrounded by a taller ridge that went around his property. Well, as you know, bulls are tough, so I'll bet you're right. I'm sure it recovered and was just fine. Yeah, I thought it was really unique that when he told me the dog man was on the hind quarters of the bull, that it was trying to jerk the legs back on the bull and make it trip and fall down. Like, that's sophisticated. You know, that's not like a wolf or a coyote or any type of hound. That's sophisticated. It takes smarts to realize once I trip this thousand pound animal up, I'm going to be able to take advantage of it. Well, I don't need to tell you dogmen are sophisticated. So, yeah, I'm not surprised in the least that it had the smarts to do that. I wonder if the dogman your uncle saw that had been stalking him in the tobacco field was the same one that attacked his bull. Did he ever tell you his thoughts on that? No, because for the way I take it, he seen it as it was running across the field. Once he left the tobacco field, it was already running across a wide open field away from him. The way that I take it, that he never did get to see its face. But I know that from what he told me between the third and fourth encounter, that that dog man only had one eye. What's the odds that it's not the same one within a few months' time? He felt like, and I also feel like from what he told me, that the same dog man that attacked his bull was also the same one that killed his fawn, his yearling, because it also only had one eye. But one thing that he never could comprehend was what killed the fawns in his yard. Was it another dog man? Because the one that he was tracking was going away from the house. So there's no way that the one he was tracking killed the fawns that were back in his yard. Oh, no, I agree. It had to be a different one. Or even worse than that, different ones. But I guess we'll never know about that. And talking about the whole one-eyed dog man thing, what's creepier than a normal dog man? One that's got one eye. That makes it even creepier. Yeah. And, you know, there are some other questions that I'd ask my uncle. In particular, there's a place that I had hunted years ago with my grandfather. 
that's not in the Daniel Boone. It's in the low country. And this place is forbidden, the place that we were at. Not the place that we started out coon hunting at. We were coon hunting that night. This place that I'm telling you about now is, it's a patch of, of forest called Scramble Ridge that is completely forbidden to go into. You're not allowed to go into it. And it's unique from Daniel Boone because it's in the flatlands. It's all flat. With that being said, with it being all flat, it's unique because when you get to it, it looks like a wall of forest that keeps going. And it's got fields that surround it, but it keeps going. It goes on for about eight miles. And I remember one incident in particular. When I was a kid, we turned loose our dogs and they went into Scramble Ridge and got treed inside of the Scramble Ridge Forest. And this is not in the county that I live in. And I start walking over there, over that way, and start to go into Scramble Ridge to get the dogs. And I remember I didn't make it in very far at all before my grandfather grabbed me and and pushed me away and said, you can't go in there. We're going to have to wait. And we waited. And the dog stayed treed, and he said, well, we'll have to come back in the morning. And they weren't that far away from where we were, the dogs weren't. I, could, I didn't understand why I couldn't go into Scramble Ridge, why I wasn't allowed. And to this day, it's forbidden. You can't go into Scramble Ridge. And it's not a part of the Daniel Boone. And I asked my uncle, what's on Scramble Ridge? What's there? And I know that once you take a couple of footsteps into Scramble Ridge, like I did as a kid, it's a wall. Like everything goes black almost because it's really extremely thick. It's so thick that you can't you can't see through it. It's really dark, dark woods. It's not like Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone's open, has a lot of oaks. This has almost no oaks. And I asked him, what's in Scramble Ridge? And what my uncle told me, he said, whatever's in Scramble Ridge is way worse than the slew foot. What goes into Scramble Ridge does not come out of Scramble Ridge. Those dogs that night that got treed in Scramble Ridge never came out of Scramble Ridge. They were gone forever, lost. And I went back down there as a teenager to Scramble Ridge in the daytime. I wanted to check it out, you know. That's also a place during that time where people, kids my age and stuff, drank. You know, we went out there because no one, everyone stays away from it. We'd go out there drinking in the fields that surrounded Scramble Ridge. And I remember that I noticed something that was really strange. There was a bunch of game trails, like wildlife trails for deer and raccoon or any type of wildlife that was padded down around the forest that never would go into Scramble Ridge. And I never understood that to this day, what's in Scramble Ridge. And my uncle told me whatever is in Scramble Ridge is way worse than Slewfoot. That's something to think about. That is worse than a dog man. Yeah, Scramble Ridge sounds like a great place to stay away from to me. Well, I thought about it like as an adult that with it only being eight miles long and it completely has fields that surround it, you know, the locals won't go into Scramble Ridge. They won't. And if a man were to take a like a Garmin tracking system that tracks up to 10 miles and put, let's say, like a, a tracking system on one end. And then the receiver on the other to walk through Scramble Ridge to see what's inside of Scramble Ridge. But I don't have the guts to do it. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Sounds like a great place to stay away from. The question is, what's scarier than a dog man? Well, I couldn't tell you. I can't think of anything that would be scarier than a dog man. When you're watching your uncle as he was sitting there listening to the shows that you did, how was he responding? He was calm, you know, like he's in his 90s. So 
and he he doesn't do technology at all. Doesn't even have a TV. He listens to Kentucky basketball games on the radio, and he gets the newspaper. It's only been the last 20 years that he's even had indoor plumbing. So he's held on to this for 20-some-odd years. And apparently he's told my cousin about it because when I let my cousin listen to Dogman Encounters episode that I done, 263, 264, he told me I needed to speak to my uncle as soon as I got the chance. Well, he's my great uncle. So I guess he's only ever told family about it, but he's seasoned. He's seen things, you know. So he was almost nonchalant when he told me the story. Like he'd already been through it. He'd already come to the realization of, of what it was, you know, of what the slew foot was, what the dog man is. It was really nonchalant. Like it was two guys talking, two good old boys just sitting down talking. And I'm absorbing all this new knowledge of something that I didn't know anyone else around here knew other than my papa. But little did I know, I still have a living relative that does know and that did have encounters. And according to him and the stories that he's told me were a natural thing as he was growing up. And that other people seen it. And that's how the Slewfoot came to existence. Even the song, the Slewfoot. Well, that's pretty deep. That's really deep stuff. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Kyle. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? No, I'm glad I got to come back on and, and tell you where I'm at in my life and on what's going on and everything. And. I'm not sure, like I told you earlier about that 13-year-old boy that was killed. I'm not sure if it was a dog man or what it was. But the state of Kentucky, to my knowledge, has never had a confirmed coyote kill. I mean, there could be one, but I just, I really want to take, want everyone to take a, a moment to just think about that and the trauma that that young man's family is probably going through at this time, whether it, it was a dog man or, or anything else that it's weighed heavily on my heart. And, uh, just to take a moment out of your day, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, and just give that young man a moment of silence. You're right. You definitely do have to feel for them. I can't even imagine what they must be going through right now. But having said that, thanks so much for coming back on and telling us about those experiences your papa and uncle had. You know, we appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, Vic. It's, uh, I didn't think I'd be back, honestly. I thought that uh, the last show that we done would be it. And I honestly didn't go out looking for more information. It kind of just came to me. And you, you never know what you're going to face in this world. And I don't know if, if this episode's helped anyone out there or not, but that's still my intention, and hopefully it does reach someone. I appreciate you and uh, and all the listeners and all the supporters that keep on supporting the Dogman community. Well, as you know, we appreciate you, and we appreciate your time as well. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a Dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.